The Candid Frame is supported by donations by listeners just like you. Help us to bring you great conversations with great photographers. Support the show today with your monthly contribution through our Patreon effort at patreon.com forward slash The Candid Frame or click on the link in the show notes or the website at thecandidframe.com. Thank you. This episode of The Candid Frame is sponsored by Storyblocks. It's the first and only subscription-based stock media company that offers unlimited downloads of member library content for a modest annual fee of just $149 per year per site while providing its contributing artists 100% of the sales revenue for their photographs, video, or audio. To find out more, visit storyblocks.com forward slash candid. This episode is also brought to you by LinkedIn Learning, the online learning platform with thousands of expert-led video tutorials to help you build your creative, tech, and business skills. For a free 30-day trial, visit linkedin.com forward slash candid to start achieving more today. This is Ibarian X, and this is The Candid Frame. When I went to San Antonio, Texas last month to attend 4x5 Photo Fest, I knew that I would meet some great photographers with some interesting stories to tell. What I wasn't expecting was to be as moved and inspired as I was. My first conversation was with Reg Campbell, whose episode we released last week. If you missed it, make some time today to listen to that. You, you won't regret it. But today, we share my conversation with Veronica G. Cardenas, a photographer whose story is no less inspiring. Her passion for the subject of migration has led her to create some stunning and jaw-dropping images of people attempting to cross the border under the most dangerous of circumstances. What's even more amazing is that she documented this not as a distant observer, but by taking some of those same risks herself. And as you'll hear, this was taken on not as an assignment for some magazine or newspaper, but rather as a personal project, which makes the journey and the photographs all the more exceptional. When others wait endlessly for permission from someone outside of themselves to make things happen in their lives, Veronica demonstrates how giving permission to yourself is all that's often needed to make something happen. Well, Veronica, welcome to the Candid Frame. We're glad to, to have a chance to talk with you uh, in doing the, the uh, research for, for the event and leading up to the interview. I was really fascinated by your, by your work. Uh, you focus a lot of, uh, on migration issues, but one of the things that really struck me when I looked at your website was a project that you call Un Retrato. You take pictures of people who are holding photographs uh, of themselves, and I was wondering if you could tell us about that, that project. Uh, I started working on that project in 2014. I was, uh, first I was, I started taking pictures of fo- butterflies and flowers, then I moved on to street photography, and I felt that I needed to do something with my photography. I wanted to help out somehow directly, so that was the best way for me to help them out through my photography. So I went to this uh, village, it's called Santa Maria de Alotepec. It's up in the mountains in Oaxaca. Oaxaca is uh, one of the southern states in Mexico. So these uh, people, a lot of them hadn't taken photo, uh, photos like in 20 years, 30, 40 years. Yeah, that really struck me about the photographs, the reality that for some people, even, you know, we live in an age where everybody has a camera now with a camera phone and so on and so forth. But there are still many people for whom a family portrait or family photograph just doesn't exist for whatever reason. And when I look at those pictures and I realize that for some of the people that you photograph, this is the only photograph that they have of themselves or their loved ones. I was really sort of struck by that. Tell me about the reaction to the people. Uh, you, know, you, may, you would make their photographs and you would give them a copy of the print. What, what did you experience in terms of your own personal experience in terms of giving that and their response to you? 
Well, a lot of them don't speak Spanish. They speak uh, another language. It's oh, called okay. Mije, and it's a variation of Mije. So in Mexico, there are about 68 different languages. And so they speak one of them. And so I had to get a fixer in that little village. The population is about 2,000 people there. And I would get a friend that would translate for me. So I really don't know exactly what um, what they were saying, okay. but I would just see their faces. And I don't think a photo was, I mean, from what I saw, I don't think it was that important for them, maybe. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, it was, but I mean, they were grateful nonetheless. Yeah, I, I participate in a thing called Help Portrait every year, mm -hmm. which is an event that was started by a, a photographer in which photographers volunteer their time to make portraits of families during the holiday season. And one of the things I would often hear from people is like, this is the only family portrait that they've ever had done. And it made me really sort of reevaluate the importance of personal photographs. So when I looked at your pictures there and I saw those people holding it, that really sort of struck me. I was wondering for you, you know, I, I know that you have had an interest in photography at some point as a person behind the camera, but I was wondering about the role of photography in growing up in terms of being able to see pictures of people that look like you. Whether was that something that you were sort of aware of early on, the disparity between the fact that you didn't see a lot of people who looked like you in the photographs that you would see like in the magazines or in newspapers or? Uh, I don't think I was drawn to photography at an early age, but I did have a fascination with documenting. Uh, so we would buy cassettes. Like my friends uh, from where, uh, I grew up in uh, Monterrey, okay. um, Nuevo Leon. So it's about a four hour drive from, from South Texas, from, from the valley where, where I'm from now. But I was born in Mexico and so we would buy cassettes and we would just record and say maybe stupid things. I don't know. We yeah. were children having fun. So, and I kept those cassettes. So it was maybe like six friends, but I would always keep those cassettes. So that's how I don't really remember photography, but I do remember having that inclination towards documenting the daily lives. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you said before that, you know, that this project was really propelled by the idea that you wanted to give back in some way that you wanted to sort of not just simply document people and photograph them, but that somehow you wanted to be of service. Why was that so important to you? Uh, I thought I felt selfish if I was just taking their photo and keeping it and not giving it back. So at that time, that's how I felt. And, okay. and I felt that was the easiest way for me to get back immediately. So initially you were doing street photography. Yes. Right? So were you one of those photographers that had discovered street photography, you started doing it and then you realized, oh, there's this thing called street photography that I've been doing? Or did you already have an awareness of it as I, you were? Yes, I already had a notion of what street photography was. And, and I really liked the, you know, that you could just follow people around and be a, a creep and <laughs> like follow them for a couple of blocks and without them noticing and waiting for the right moment. <laughs> so, yeah. so what do you feel that gave you in terms of a skill set that has helped you in terms of you doing the documentary work? Well, the best advice I was ever given uh, was look for the light. So I would wait for the or, you know, Cartier-Bresson, that he would wait for the right moment for the... So I would wait for that moment and kind of see things that as they were developing and wait and just be around and be fast and then without them noticing that you were there. Now, you, we were talking earlier and you had mentioned that you were a school teacher. Yes. Sixth grade, right? Yes. You're teaching math? Yes. Okay. So you got to tell me about that. How do you sort of get into that career and then at some point decide, oh, I want to do something different and something creative with a camera. So I started teaching in 2012. And by the time I had started taking uh, photos, like street photos, so I would go to Oaxaca. And so every, every chance I would get, like when I would get vacations from Thanksgiving. So during Thanksgiving, I wouldn't spend it with family. I would go to Mexico and spend the time over there with friends or people I just met. And then spring break and of course the summer so I would go take pictures, street photos over there. And then when I would come back, I couldn't take photos because I had to go back to my routine of being a teacher and just being on teacher mode. Okay. Um, 
So I was frustrated. I was a frustrated street photographer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Why did you find yourself going to Mexico as opposed to staying close to home to be a street photographer? Well, the area where I live, uh, you're familiar with McAllen. You know that everything is so far away from everything. And there's no people walking in the streets. And that's why I would get frustrated because I couldn't do street photography. And so I would come back and then shut down my creative mode. So I was teacher mode. But I, I had that um, anxiety, you know, and like, I, I wanted to do s street photography. Yeah. Then from there, I, I thought, okay, well, there must be something I can do here in the valley. So one of the things that, um, that, you, that sort of changed your life was an accident. Uh, tell us about the, the accident and how that sort of changed, changed your life. Yes, well, I was in a car accident four years ago now, and so I was teaching at the time. This happened during the summer. We, uh, my ex and I were driving and we were T-boned, so I received most of the hit on my side. The, we were driving my mom's vehicle at the time, which we were lucky because my my other vehicle didn't have side airbags. My mom's did. So we were T-boned and the truck, it was an F-150, went in for about a foot. But it had side airbags, so that's why I'm alive now. But anyways, I broke my tibia, fibula, they put a metal rod. I broke my pelvis, my coccyx, two ribs. And then I'm not, like, I'm, well, you can't see it from here, but. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I broke this finger, you might be able to see it. And then she's giving the middle finger for demonstration purposes, not, yeah, I'm not, not because she feels anything you know, about it. No, no, I'm just showing you. Um, and then I <laughs> turned this finger. <laughs> and <laughs> this was tragic, guys. Please don't laugh. <laughs> Very traumatic experience. Anyways, in my lung collapse, I was uh, I had a, I was intubated as well. That's when I realized that you can die any day and, you know, fuck it, just do what you want to do. So that's when I decided that I needed to quit my job. And I said, you know what, I'm quitting. But this was 2013, I had to recuperate, I had a bone infection, and super long story short, I was able to quit my job a year and a half ago, and I don't have uh, like a journalistic experience, I didn't go to school for that. I'm just kind of learning as I see things and... You know, I've talked to so many photographers who transition from one career into another. You know, they're doing something that earns them a decent living, regular income, in, you know, they have health insurance, all that. And yet they make the choice to make the leap into trying to lead a life that's creative as a photographer. And a lot of people cannot do that. They make the choice not to do that because they feel like this is safer. They don't want to take the risks. Granted that you had this, you know, this this moment where you almost lost your life, but that doesn't necessarily equate into people still making the choice. So what do you think helped take you over that line to be able to say, I'm going to do this. I'm going to quit this job and I'm going to try to find a way of making a living as a photographer. Uh, I was reading also this blog uh, by Eric Kim. He's a street photographer and he's so motivational in so many ways, not just photography, but just the advice that he gives. And he would say that a lot. Yeah. <laughs> not, not necessarily quitting your job, but maybe dedicating more time to do what you want to do. Or um, in some of his blogs, he did mention about quitting your job, what you do, and then, you know, doing something else. So I would read blogs about that and... But did you find, what, what helped you sort of just make the choice? Because you said you had experienced that accident and you had to recover from it, but you just recently sort of quit the job. So what was the final thing that allowed you to say, I am going to do it? Because well, you can think about it, say, yeah, I'm, I should quit my job, I should quit my job. And a year later, you're still saying, I should quit my job, to the point where you're actually going, I quit. Well, well, first of all, the last year that I was teaching, I started that school year and I said, you know what, this is it. This is my last year teaching. I don't want to teach anymore. The kids deserve someone better, someone that can be here 100% for them. And I am not 100% for them, you know. I've been selfish and I do need my own time to do my, you know, my projects. So I said, this is the last year that I'm going to teach. Then I said, like halfway through the year, I said, okay, maybe I can save some money and then quit my job later next year. I'll teach one more year. But then something happened at school. There were some issues. Long story short, um, I had asked, if, I mean, I am, I'm, I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual. So I had asked for guidance. So then three days later, something happens at school that I could have taken it the wrong way and say, oh man, life sucks. Or No, I said, okay, yeah, this is my cue. Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah, I need to quit. So I told the principal uh, a few days later that I, that I was going to resign. How did that feel? Liberating. Yeah. Yeah, it was liberating. <laughs> awesome. Well, one of the other projects that really struck me was your Traveling Souls uh, project, uh, in which you, well, you can tell us what, what that uh, is about. And for some of the people here, they may see some of the pictures here in the slideshow. But for people who are listening, uh, tell us what that project was. So Traveling Souls, it's a play on words. It means, it's actually spelled S-O-E-L-S. So these are shoes that belong to asylum seekers, mainly people coming from Central America and then crossing through the Rio Grande Valley. So I got these shoes, so in 2000, well, let me go back. In 2014, there was uh, an increase of migrants coming you know, to the United States, and that's when they opened up the Humanitarian Respite Center in McAllen. So I had just started like doing my own like documentary work, and because obviously I didn't work for the New York Times or the local newspaper, they didn't allow me to take pictures of their faces. And they said, no, you can take pictures of their feet, their hands, their backs. And I said, okay, you know, yeah, it's all right. Even though I had gotten permission from the main person to take pictures of their faces too. But mm -hmm. at that time when the volunteers were there, they wouldn't let me. So then I saw that they were throwing away the shoes that, that they had came in with. Because they would provide clean clothes, new shoes or clean shoes and a meal and sometimes they would stay there like a night at the shelter. Well, let me go back and explain. So after their process through immigration, then they drop, the immigration drops them off at the, um, at the bus station. And then at the bus station, volunteers from the respite center go pick them up so they can change and make calls to their family members, right? I saw that they were throwing away the shoes and me thinking, take pictures of feet, hands, backs. And then I saw shoes. And then I remember the movie uh, Forrest Gump. Uh, mm -hmm. His mom yeah. said that um, you can tell a lot about the person by the shoes. So that came to mind. And I said, you know what? I'm going to do something with these shoes. Fast forward two years later, because that didn't happen. I was working as a teacher. Two years later, I was able to start working on the project and I collecting the shoes. That was like a whole another deal. But anyways, <laughs> like I had to go there constantly after school. I would go and check if there were any shoes. Like, are there any shoes? And so I collected 250, which at the time represented the largest number of people that had arrived in one day at the Humanitarian Respite Center. But shortly before elections, two weeks before elections uh, last year, that number rose to like 300, 400 people every day. Wow. The highest number was uh, November the 29th. It reached 433 people there in one day. Um, so then I had to update my project. And you'll see, when you see the images, you see images of the Humanitarian Respite Center. And you're going to see some uh, where we place the 433 pairs of shoes in places where they've traveled through, such as the Rio Grande. So you see one image where you see Mexico on one side and then the U.S. on the other side. And you see the pictures, I mean the shoes there. And also the one at the port of entry in Hidalgo. So we, that was another, you know, different deal to get that photo because that's the government's property. And, uh, okay. <laughs> but, you know, you, when you know the right people, like Sister, key, yeah. <laughs> Sister Norma Pimentel, who is the nun that opened up the shelter. I mean, she has a very good uh, communication with the ICE agents there. If you're in the business of producing some kind of media content, you know how much time is spent in pre-production. Whether it's a video, a podcast, an annual report, a newsletter, you often spend a lot of time trying to find just the right content to accompany the text or script. But you often spend way too much time scouring various online resources trying to find that right content. Storyblocks provides the perfect solution for that kind of time suck. Not only is it affordable, it also provides income for the content creators themselves, whether they are a photographer, a videographer, or illustrator. That's because Storyblocks provides you access to high-resolution photo, vector, or audio, and they are all royalty-free. And for the creators who contribute their work, it's also great because they enjoy 100% of the sales commission. To find out more, go to storyblocks.com forward slash candid to get all the stock images, video, and audio you can imagine for just $149. That's S-T-O-R-Y-B-L-O-C-K-S dot com slash candid to download anything from thousands of images, video, and tracks, and unlock discounts from millions more. 
You know, it's always fascinating, and I've heard this countless number of times. You go in thinking you're going to do one thing, and then for whatever reason, there's a limitation that's put on you, right? Like in this case, you can't show faces, and all of a sudden that transforms it and makes it even better than you could have imagined. Exactly. Because when I look at those photographs, I am so struck by the shoes and the presence that's suggested by them that I think would have been completely lost had you been photographing just several hundred people in that shot, right? But when you see the shoes, that presence, you, you feel it in a way that you don't when you just see a mob of people in a scene. Yes, and w what I wanted to do is, uh, instead of showing a bar graph where it shows, oh, in 2014, you know, there's 250 people. That was the largest number that arrived in one day. So now you see pictures. So you see 250 shoes in one image. And in, another, in the other images, you see 433. So it's, and I wanted to, in a way, humanize an animate object and also humanize the experience. So there are six pairs of shoes where it has the, the story. So if you go to my website, yeah. you see the story to those shoes. Yeah, I, I could imagine that anybody looking in your car one day was just like, this woman's crazy, look at all these shoes. Well, yes, I do drive around with, <laughs> with some <laughs> shoes still. <laughs> yeah. I, but one of, the, one of the other things that you've done is uh, you've, you've ridden on the Bestia which is a train that comes down from southern Mexico up to Tijuana, where people actually will ride on this train uh, as they try to migrate up into the United States. Why did you, <laughs> did you do this? Because this is one of the more dangerous ways of, uh, of, of, of not only getting up there for the people who are migrating, but much less someone who is there with a camera as a photographer. So what, what, in, you know, what impressed you, you know, what inspired you to journey to make this trip yourself and to document it? It was traveling souls. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that, that's what started it, I think. So I would listen to their stories, and I wanted to have a better understanding of what they go through. But, I, you know, at least get a slight idea, because I was with them for a couple of days, you know, a few days. I didn't go through the whole journey that they go through. Actually, some of them just ride on buses, so if they have more money to pay the coyote, the smuggler, right, so they can just take them all the way to the border in buses. But I wanted to know what it was like to ride the train. But uh, that's no small feat. It's not like catching an Amtrak here in the States. I mean, most of those people are literally running to get, get on the train. They're riding on the top of this, you know, these cargo containers, often under a really oppressive heat. Uh, there are a variety of different dangers of, you know, people who are thieving, raping, you know. Some people are traveling with children, some children are traveling all by themselves. Uh, tell me about, you know, the experience of getting on that train and what you experienced, you know, as you, as you did it. Because you've done it twice so far, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So how was that that first time? Well, the first time, um, so my family doesn't know about this because I don't want them to know. <laughs> so <laughs> don't tell them. Uh, or I think they don't know. Maybe they do know. I don't know. So I, um, I live in South Texas, which is about four hours away from Monterrey, and the flights are very cheap from there. So I got a bus from where I live to Monterrey, and then a flight from Monterrey to Mazatlan, and then from Mazatlan I got two buses and a cab to get to where the train was. And I literally just saw it pass by, and um, it was in Mazatlan, Sinaloa, so I was literally running. I knew, I mean, I was not going to try to get on the train. That would have been crazy. Um, well, it wasn't crazy enough. Huh? No, <laughs> that, that would have been crazy. <laughs> so I was running. I didn't know anybody. Uh, I found out about the refugee caravan because of a friend who's a lawyer was volunteering to screen the cases of the asylum seekers. So she told me about it, and so she got me that contact, right? So when I get there, the train was leaving, and I, at least I wanted to take a photo, and I thought, okay, I'll just spend the night in this town and figure out where I can meet them tomorrow. You know, I'll take a bus or whatever. Then I didn't know that there were two vans, that that's where the women were traveling. And, and then so I called the organizer who was riding the train, and he said, no, no, let me call the man that is driving the, one of the vans. So he called him, they waited for me, I went running to catch up to him, and 
I was in shock because I had just gotten there, right? And I'm like, oh, what do I do? He said, well, are you going to get on the van or not? Or are you staying? I said, well, no, I'm going with you guys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you, you told me you're talking about these caravans that it's, it's groups of people that are sort of led up to Tijuana. Uh, but they're, they're doing it in groups in order to sort of be safe because, you know, they don't want to be victimized by whoever may be alongside, you know, with all these bad intentions. So... That was sort of key to your access, wasn't it? The fact that you were within a group that's collectively trying to move people as safely as possible. Yes, so I knew I was reasonably safe, you were pretty safe. At no point did I feel unsafe, yeah. because there was, uh, so in the first caravan that I joined, there were 200 riding the train. In the second one, and I, the photos that you just saw, those are from the second caravan. I took those photos about two weeks ago. There was a subgroup in the first caravan. They would call themselves the perros, the dogs. So they they would they were um, the security, pretty much. And the first time that I joined the caravan, so we were sleeping in the street, waiting for the train. Uh, and the people that were sleeping closer to the street, they almost got robbed. So there was four guys, and one of them had a gun. And so the guy that was sleeping next to me told me, "Get your camera ready because something's going on." Something's going to happen. So I did, but it was pitch dark. So I couldn't take photos without, you know, I don't want to use flash. So I didn't take photos. But I saw everybody running towards the guys. It was like 30 people. And so the, the guy that was um, awake that night t taking care of us, so the, one, the guy that was taking, keeping a, uh, an eye, he said, wake up, wake up, everyone. Nobody's going to sleep. And so we all woke up. And there it was, the four guys running, and then they're chasing them, and then one of them had a gun. The guy was pointing them at them with, and at their feet, but he never fired the gun. Maybe he didn't have any bullets. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> or he thought he was probably going to get lynched because it was so many of us. It's the power of numbers. <laughs> so, you know, you're, you're in a situation that is completely foreign to you, you know, where there, there are all these possibilities of things going wrong. My last instinct is to bring out a camera, right? And all of a sudden go, okay, hi, I'm the photographer. So did you have any sort of reticence in terms of bringing out a camera? Or was somehow, because you were working within this, this group of this caravan, uh, did it make it easier for you to make photographs? Yes, uh, at least when we were in the train, it was fairly easy to take photos because uh, the one of the organizers, the one that is always riding the train, he got them used to the camera because he was always recording live just to document what was going on. So they were used to the camera. So how did, how did that change your perspective? Because as before you said, uh, when you were doing the one about the shoes, people would tell you stories. And you know, being from Texas and being aware of migrant issues, you've always heard of the stories. But how did the experience of actually being on the train, meeting the people, seeing and, and living that experience change your perspective in terms of who these, people, who these people are and what they have to experience in order to get over it? Well, there was a moment when, when I, and it's stupid, right? Because, well, I was saving my battery and I had an extra battery, but I was checking Facebook and, and then somebody was complaining about them not liking the shirts that we're getting for free. They were green shirts instead of blue or something like that. And then I would look at the person that was in front of me on the train. Um, that, that's all they have, what they're wearing. Mm. So it was, a different, at a different level of understanding because you hear those stories, right? Like I would hear those stories there at the, at the shelter, but seeing it there firsthand and seeing that that is all they have and that it sucks being there. And I was just, I was there. So I put myself in a situation like that because I didn't want to have more privileges than them. So I didn't carry or I wasn't treated any differently. Well, I think, I don't know, maybe I was, but I was, my, my greatest privilege was to be there by choice. Yeah. And they were there not by choice, but because they were forced to. So you did this trip the second time just a couple of weeks ago? Yes, about two weeks ago. Two weeks ago. How different was it from the first time? So the first time the women and children were traveling in vans. And this time around, because they couldn't raise enough money, uh, it's called Pueblos Sin Fronteras. They couldn't raise enough money, so the women and children had to ride the train as well. And, you know, there was this woman that was in her 
early 60s. And we were getting on top of the train. I, I'm afraid of heights. Very, very much afraid of heights. <laughs> but, and when I saw the train, I thought we were going to get the gondola style, which is like a shoebox. And I thought, uh, okay, that's going to be nice. Hopefully they'll be nice to us and they're going to give us those trains. But no, they didn't want to stop the train for us or anything like that. So uh, one of the guys that was there with us uh, from the refugee caravan, he actually stopped the train. He, he just jumped on the train. He stopped the train so we could all get on the train. Um, and then I saw that, that there were no gondolas and I just looked up and I said, fuck. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't want to get up there. You know, I'm a little heavy and I don't want to get up there. <laughs> and I'm afraid of heights. But then I saw that the women were already getting on, you know, on top of it with their children. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and how so, long is that trip? Well, it, it depends because the train sometimes they're scheduled to, you know, get out at uh, one time and then they postpone it a couple of hours or a day. So it could be about four weeks, three weeks, depending. Okay. Yeah. I can imagine that it's a difficult, difficult journey to make, but, you know, you're there to document it as a photographer and you're, you're limited in terms of what you can do and where you can move, right? Because you're on the train car. You know, so, you know, you can't freely just move around and willy-nilly no. and make your photograph. So, you know, when you're up there, you're trying to make sure you don't fall off the damn thing. But you're also trying to figure out, oh, there's a good picture over there. So tell me about sort of negotiating all of that in terms of trying to make, stay safe, but also trying to get the picture. See, that was uh, the issue that we were on, on those, the trains that you have to ride on top and because I'm afraid of heights, very, very, very much afraid of heights, I couldn't move when the train was moving. <laughs> so I was just oh, sitting down. Okay. Uh, I would see photos, but I would take the photo with my eyes, like Reggie was saying. <laughs> so I would take the photo with my eyes and, you know, just enjoy that. But I was limited just to the space where I was. And then I dehydrated myself on purpose. Bad idea. But because I didn't want to get off the train to go to the restroom. The train would just take off. I mean, it takes a little while for it to take off, but yeah. I didn't want to run and then get on, on the ladder while it was moving. So what was the longest stretch of uninterrupted movement that you were on oh, the train for? About, I don't know, maybe 12 hours? Probably. 12 hours. That's pretty brutal. Close to 10 hours, something like that. Yeah. But I remember not using or going to the restroom for... 19 hours, 20 hours. That's a lot to put yourself for the sake of photographs. I know you said your family doesn't know, but I'm sure there are a lot of people going, why put yourself through that in order to make the photographs? Did you ever ask yourself, what am I doing? Yes. And what was the I answer? don't know why. And <laughs> I also like the, you know, hanging out with them. Yeah. Uh, and, and just the way you become so close in just, a, you know, two, three days, you become so close because, you know, these are moments that they'll never forget. And I like, I like that feeling. People that you just met and that you're looking out for each other. There was, um, uh, we we're going to talk about a project called A Trump, but I wanted to start off with this quote that uh, this is on your blog and I'll read it. It says, the photographer vid vividly remembers the conversation she had with one man while they were waiting at the International Bridge. She approached him and he was wary of the camera. He was sure she was being paid for, for the pictures and they're talking about you in this case. Even when she explained to him that this was a personal project for her, he told her, no, 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 no. You people only take advantage of us. And I thought that was incredibly poignant because I'm sure, because I know there have been a lot of photographers who have gone to sort of document this whole thing of migration. And even though you may have looked similar to some of the people that you were photographing, that that perception that you were an other, that it was only here to make them look bad, to take advantage of them, I'm sure that that made an impression on you in some form. And I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about that, about the choice to photograph the people that you're photographing under these very sort of difficult circumstances where, like, as you said, they don't have a whole lot of choice, right? And you're directing a camera uh, at them. Well, um, that quote was from my Trump project. The Trump project, yes. right. Uh, I never experienced any of that with a refugee caravan. Uh, mm. They just allowed me to take photos freely, pretty much. What I had, the challenge was 
to take photos without them noticing because they were so aware of the camera since they were used to being recorded live on Facebook. So they were always saying, hey, you know, say hi to the camera. So they were always kind of aware. So that was the challenge. So it was quite the opposite. But was in, so that was from, from a from a Trump. Yeah, I, I was just I was just wondering if that because of the the Trump series, the series where you have people wearing a Trump mask, doing a variety of different um, jobs or work uh, on both sides of the border. But that quote really kind of struck me because sometimes I, I thought a lot about how people uh, people of a different class, a uh, different race, a different culture are oftentimes the subject of photographs by someone outside of their community, right? And as well as, as well intentioned as many of those people may be, um, there's still a sense that the people who are being photographed don't have much control over that. And so for me as a photographer, I think I'm always conscious of that, not to the point that it sort of keeps me from making the photographs, but it's something that I'm aware of. And I was wondering about your own awareness about those issues when you were choosing to photograph. Well, there was uh, one of the photos, actually, when I was in the van. I didn't take photos. I saw the photo when I had just gotten in the van in the first refugee caravan. I saw the photo happening, but I didn't pick up my camera to take the photo because we were so close and I, I was an implant to the situation. Mm -hmm. So I didn't want to be intrusive, so I waited. Until, the, until I, they got more used to me, because we were in this really small space. So I waited, and so that man, he said that the quote that you read, that was when, before I took my very first photo from the Trump project, yeah. and I could have said, you know what, yeah, let me, I'm not gonna do it, I'll just quit. But no, I actually said, you know what, this is good. Yeah. And I tried explaining to him and he couldn't understand because he saw me as a privileged person. Mm -hmm. He was waiting there uh, in between Mexico and the U.S. in that bridge right there where you see the, the line, the division. I thought it would, I like his stomach. He had a beer belly. And <laughs> <laughs> so I felt pretty bad when he told me that because I do, I do see why he would say that. Yeah. We also have the support of LinkedIn Learning. LinkedIn Learning is for people who love to create things and are always looking for ways to get better at what they do. Maybe you want to learn how to master your digital camera or learn how to composite in Photoshop or how to tell a story using still images. Everything you need to achieve more is on LinkedIn Learning. Whether you shoot photos for work or pleasure or both, LinkedIn Learning helps you to take your photography to that next level. Gear courses will help you to get the most out of your camera from DSLR to mirrorless to smartphone. To help you enhance what you shoot, there's complete coverage of Lightroom and Photoshop, including CC 2018. In fact, they work closely with Adobe to release updated courses the day new versions are released. And now you can take advantage of this great resource for free for 30 days. You can enjoy courses like Joe McNally's Location Photography course, where he walks you through his entire process for creating portraits of a professional belly dancer. He is just one of the many great photographers who share the knowledge and experience, and it's all accessible worldwide on your computer, phone, or tablet. And the best thing is that there are no hidden charges or upsells. Access all the courses you want for one monthly price. You can get a free 30-day trial with LinkedIn Learning today by visiting linkedin.com forward slash candid. That's linkedin.com slash candid, all lowercase. And we thank them for sponsoring this podcast. And remember, when you support our sponsors, you help make this podcast possible. Well, tell us about the, the Trump project and how that whole came about. Uh, that... I thought of that a few months before elections, and it wasn't until he was elected president that I said, you know what, I am gonna do it. So first I wanted to create an alternate reality where Trump is an undocumented immigrant, and actually I changed the noun undocumented immigrant, immigrant with Trump. So now you don't say he's an illegal, you say he's a Trump. And so what, they wear the mask, right, because they want to protect their identity, because their vulnerability has been exposed. So you, uh, you saw photos from 
uh, Mexico, so that represents the population that is most likely to become undocumented because of the lack of opportunities or for their own safety as well. And one of the things I was reading about it, it wasn't to, um, to say anything negative about Trump, you know, a, a, as a person. It wasn't, a, 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 it wasn't for the purpose of mocking him that you were doing this. So how do you sort of explain to people what, what's sort of behind it? Well, what it means is that they want to hide their identity. And you have the most powerful man on earth, quote unquote, and you have the most vulnerable person on earth. So you have people on the opposite sides of the spectrum. That's why they want to protect their identity. So they use the most powerful man on earth, right? Because nobody's going to mess with that person. Yeah. So in, in, I mean, in the area where I live, uh, I have friends, uh, well, their parents are very afraid to just go out because they're undocumented. And so instead of running errands every single day, they try to do all the errands in one day because they don't want to risk just getting pulled over by a cop and then deported. Because there have been cases where, um, you know, they're riding their bicycle on the opposite side of the street and then, you know, they get at, uh, arrested yeah. and they're deported. So that's why they're afraid. You know, one of the things about photographing people that you don't know, it's always this little level of anxiety about going up to someone and saying, I find you interesting. Do you mind if I make your photograph? Uh, you complicated it by going, hi, I find you interesting. I'd like to make your photograph. And would you mind putting on this mask? <laughs> so yeah. tell me about the sort of the challenge in terms of convincing people to put on a mask for the purpose of, this, of these photographs? Uh, at least in Mexico, it was very difficult to get those pictures. Like the first, the quote that you read, that was the first man that I encountered, and he said, absolutely not, <laughs> uh, in so many different ways. I had to beg people. There was one of a prostitute uh, as well, and I, she said no, and then I said, hey, you know, I'll pay you. And they said, but I just want the picture. I don't need your services. <laughs> <laughs> just, and I said, okay, whatever. Just, I'll still charge you the same. No, nah, I came for almost nothing. But uh, yeah, she was busy. Uh, a friend. So all of the people that I took pictures for that project, these are people I just met that day. So I had an idea of what I wanted to do or I was passing by. I would drive with my camera. I mean, in my, in my in the mask, which I forgot it, it's in my car. Oh, Maybe I'll okay. bring it. But so I would I would drive around and then I would think of something and I would dedicate maybe like a day and say, okay, you know, I'm gonna look for this. And so in the US it was slightly easier to take pictures. And maybe that's because it was at the beginning. Uh, you know, when he had just been elected president, people were more afraid. I don't know, it's kind of a social experiment too. And there was uh, one image, it, it took me hours to take that photo because there were so many people walking, I mean, passing by, it was at a flea market. Mm. So, though, I mean, I had to really beg people to do it. And some would just do it very willingly. Yeah. And the mask had represented uh, like so many different things. So sometimes people said like, I don't want to see it, take it away from me. Kind of joking, but still, they didn't want to see it. And, and some others would put it on and act as if they were the big boss. Yeah. You know, what's interesting about that, that body of work is that if you just saw, like, just one picture, it would strike you as like, well, that's kind of odd, right? But then when you see them in a series and you see all these people doing different things, it gives you a, it, it all of a sudden brings a whole new perspective that it's not just one image that's sort of funny, all of a sudden you have to think of that mask within the context of those people's activities. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm, I was wondering whether or how you sort of experienced the project that once you had a certain number of images under your belt, that when you were seeing it as a body of work, did you discover something new about what you were doing? Uh, yes, actually a friend was the one that helped me. She would ask me several questions. She was the one that helped me give it like more meaning. Mm -hmm. Her name is Ileana. She's an English teacher, exceptional teacher. And so she was the one that helped me develop this, this whole idea. Because at first I just thought visual. Okay. And then she saw my images and she started asking me these questions. So what kind of questions was he asking you? Uh, why are they, why did they choose to wear his mask? Why not another mask? Mm -hmm. uh, so questions, I forgot the other ones, but she was asking very specific questions. 
So what are they trying to do with the, why are they covering their identity? And for you, and for you, how did, how did the way you looked at the project change? It cha when she asked me those questions, I actually had some images where, and I really like one of the images, but the guy was, had a tattoo. And I said, oh, right. If they're covering their identity, you can identify them by the tattoos. So that's when I, I had to think about my subjects a little bit more. And so when I was at the flea market, it took me three or four hours just to get a picture there. Yeah. Most people would say no. And I said, oh, look, nobody's going to know it's you. You, you know, you have a long yeah. sleeve shirt, you, you, you're recovering your face. And so that's what changed when my friend asked me this question. So then the, the project sort of took another, uh, you know, spin. Yeah. I mean, when you look at your website, a lot of your work is personal work, some of your street photography work. But as you said earlier, you've left a career in teaching in order to, you know, make a living as a freelance photographer. So um, tell me about that journey, especially since, you know, what you're seeing on your on your site is is largely personal work in terms of you being able to get clients for, you know, either editorial or maybe some commercial work. Tell me, tell me about what that experience is, considering what your existing body of work is on your site. Well, I just started freelancing a few months ago, yeah. and I also work as an uh, architect's assistant. That's what I used to do before I was teaching. Um, so I, I'm just starting. I know it's like a whole other world. So how does that feel to you? But it feels good. I've had other opportunities to go back to teaching or do other things or work at a community college, but... No, I'm, I'm not going back. So, I mean, I know that uh, economically speaking, I wouldn't have to worry about it. Right. Uh, but no, I, I decided I'm doing this. That's great. Because a lot of, because there's a moment of transition, which I think a lot of people fear. But like you said, there's a certain feeling of freedom and liberation that you have there. That goes a long way. I mean, once you have a taste of that, it makes it really hard to go back to what you did before. Impossible. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what are you exploring? What are you hoping to explore now? I mean, you obviously want to make a career as a photographer, but since you're, you're, you're focusing on so many issues in terms of migration, uh, identity, um, what ideally would you like to be working on? Migration and identity, yeah? <laughs> yes. Uh, I, migration is my, you know, my first love, I would say, when it comes to documentary work. And I mean, that's the only thing that has um, called me, I guess, for now, because I'm, I was born in Mexico, right? And then I came to the U.S. a long time ago. So maybe because I, in a way, I see myself reflected, although I didn't go what they went through. That's why I put myself in this situation so I could experience it. Experience that, yeah. yeah. So, you know, one of the things about focusing on something that you're really passionate about is that it can, it can be a really challenge, a challenge to be able to stick to it, right? Because you get pulled, especially when you're a freelancer, you get pulled by this idea of, oh, I got to make a living. So I'll have to do kind of work that I really don't want to do. That's not, that doesn't feed my passion. How concerned are you with those temptations in terms of what you obviously want to dedicate your time to, but then also those sort of the real world demands on being able to sort of keep a roof over your head and food in your mouth. I, I don't know. I guess I'm being kind of stubborn and trying to stick to it. And I live with some friends that are wonderful friends, so I don't pay rent there. <laughs> <laughs> that, um, helps. that helps a lot. Uh, and just me saying, no, I, I don't want to go back to the same lifestyle that I had. Yeah. I just can't go back. So... I'm sorry. And I have a, like other projects, um, the shoe project, yeah. I plan on taking it to Washington, D.C. in the next couple of months. So I want to get 433 volunteers to wear the shoes. We're going to do a protest and then in front of the White House. Oh, wow. Yeah. So that, I guess those projects keep me motivated. And that's why I said I can't go back. Ex excellent point. The idea of having something that sort of keeps that spark alive is absolutely invaluable. So that's that's... The, yeah, I think that that is really part and parcel because I've heard that in a lot of conversations I've had because during those those dark moments of the soul, you know, you have to have something that is putting the fire underneath you and going, this is why I'm doing it. This is why I'm trying to make a difference. But I have to say that within the short period of time that you've been shooting, you've produced some amazing work oh, because you. you've been willing to take risks 
that a lot of people with more experience as photographers wouldn't make, right? And I think that's pretty a fascinating part of your story. And were you always that kind of a risk taker? Or do you think that it's primarily because of photography that you have, you find yourself making those choices? Oh, I was very different even five years ago. Really? How I was so? a very different person, but photography changed me. So explain to me that. What were you like before and what are you like uh, now? Well, I was very shy and I, I'm still very shy. But because if I'm talking about my work, I'm not shy. Right? Uh-huh. But, but I'm, I'm a shy person and I was super shy before. I would never take risks. Never. Never take risks. Wow. I lived a pretty, I, I don't know how to say it, but yeah, I would never take risks pretty much. And now you're on top of a train. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's an, I think that's, that's wonderful. I mean, that's uh, the, the whole idea. Because I, I, I love, that's one of the reasons I love doing this show, is talking to people who are willing to take those kinds of risks in order to make things happen. And uh, I, I give you all the props for, for everything that you've accomplished you. and everything that you're going to accomplish. It's well, just, just great. So my last question to you is a question I ask each guest. And that I ask them to recommend a photographer for our listeners to discover and explore. And it can be anyone, someone you've long admired or someone you've recently discovered. So who would that photographer be and why? Well, there are so many. Um, maybe a general advice. If you like a photo, just try to see why you like it and then just deconstruct it. And so whatever photographer you like, like if you like that photographer's photos, then uh, really study that photographer and see why you like those pictures better than other photos and try to imitate the style. And if I have to mention a name, and I mentioned it earlier, Eric Kim, uh, erickimphotography.com, I think that's his website. Um, His blog is so inspirational in so many ways. That's where I got some, that's where I got my inspiration to, to do the projects. Oh, Veronica, it was a real pleasure to speak with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to Veronica for sharing her time and her story with us. To find out more, visit her website at veronicagabriella.com. And remember, I'll be in Miami next week for the Miami Street Photography Festival, where I and several other photographers will be teaching workshops and classes. Also, I'll be leading two live panel discussions for the show. You can find out more by visiting miamistreetphotographyfestival.org. And thank you for your continued support of The Candid Frame. We are close to releasing 400 episodes, and I would love to see a host of five-star reviews to help promote the show before then. If you haven't already, please take the time today to write a review in the iTunes store. Your ratings and comments help people to discover the great conversations that we offer here at TCF. You can also support the show by making a monthly contribution through Patreon. Visit patreon.com forward slash the candid frame, or you'll find the link in the show notes and the candid frame website. Or if you just want to make a one time contribution to the show, you can do so via PayPal by clicking on our donate button on the candid frame website or show notes. To access our complete archive of interviews, download the free Candid Frame app, available for Apple iOS and Android. Not only will you immediately receive the latest episode on your phone or tablet, but you can now easily share your favorite episodes on your own social networks and help spread the word. And if you want to drop me a line with comments or suggestions for the show, you can email me directly from the app. Download it today by clicking on the link in the show notes or the website at thecandidframe.com. The Candid Frame's audio engineer is Martin Taylor, who you can find at the other martintaylor.com. The show's senior producer is Cynthia Parker, and our music is from Kevin McLeod, whose royalty-free music can be found at incompetech.com. And you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at simply at IbadianX. And this is IbadianX, and this is The Candid Frame.